makes more sense to speak about uh i mean this is also how you begin your book uh you mm-hmm. talk about work and the meaning of life or the the connect the relation between work and the meaning of life and it's uh, it seems like a very intuitive connection that we make uh without work what is the meaning of life yeah uh, isn't work what keeps us sane or you know what what make what, what gives us some sense of purpose in in, in everyday life hmm. um and this is a question you raise early on in the book before yes. uh, progressing further um yeah so would you like to say about that sure um i felt that this was a question that really resonates on two different planes the first plane is universal and in some way timeless which is a question about the nature of the human being and is there uh there's an element of the human being that is given over to work i think that's a kind of unquestioned premise of the book that human history more or less confirms at every turn that the human being is a being that works um that is uh it, it, a creature that expands and develops and grows and is interested in creating new combinations uh enlarging units um of social and political and cultural life So work is a kind of necessary consequence of being human. What I think gets left out of account increasingly as far uh, as sort of our self-understanding goes is that non-work is also an important dimension of the human being. Um inactivity um inertia sleep um and also the space for meditation for reflective contemplation in other words there's a whole region of life that involves not acting not doing things that involves an immersion in being this is um <clears throat> of course an important theme in many different ancient cultures and religions um and it seems to me also to be a given fact of human life this is something we all know about ourselves that we are creatures that are as well as do we are creatures that sleep as well as wake um but this is where we get to the second plane because the second plane is more historical it's more to do with the nature of our modernity and i think as yeah. as modern life has developed and accelerated the second dimension the non-working dimension of the human being has really been marginalized has been sort of exempted from our self understanding um until it's become a kind of embarrassment or an inconvenience um sleep is a kind of a bit of personal hygiene that we have to uh tolerate uh until perhaps a technology can come along and help us do without sleep um and inactivity in general is seen as a kind of interval short way stations on the way to doing something else um and the ways in which work works today i think enforces this idea that we don't need to be interested in or curious about the non-working aspect of ourselves um and i think with the acceleration of a 24/7 always on culture um it's more and more difficult for people to acknowledge and explore their non-working selves. Um and finally there's a kind of irony about this about the way in which we're moving towards a 24/7 culture or we perhaps we we've arrived there in the sense that we are facing a horizon of automation 
um, of artificial intelligence, um, uh, which will cause quite significant and structural labor shortages across global labor markets, uh, shortages of jobs. There won't be uh, jobs for everybody, I think. Um, uh, and it, this is not just a question of the automatization of uh, um, low skilled or manual labor um, by, by robots. Um, I think a lot of what we think of as middle class labor, um, drawing up legal documents, uh, um, doing the accounts. Um, increasingly, we find that that is turning over to apps, to various forms of artificial intelligence. So we need to be thinking about this question. What is the human being, if not a, a working human being? What is the meaning of life if it isn't work? This is not just a kind of abstract philosophical question to contemplate in the meadow on a summer's day. It's actually a question which is facing us um, in the near future. Many of us will have to ask this question. Um, if work isn't going to define my life, what is? Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a lot of interesting points to pick out from there. Um, yeah. um, uh, I suppose initially uh, the the kind of historical reason for the modern situation uh, is also fascinating, and I, I suppose we can delve on that a little bit before moving on on to discuss the uh, psychodynamic or the the psychological reason for our ambivalent relationship to work, right? Mm. Um, yeah, because I mean that's a much more um, that th that deserves much more uh, a more thorough conversation. Uh, whereas the on on the on the first uh, plane that you're talking about on the historical uh, reasons for our present situation, um, of course you you uh, where you mentioned in your book um, Weber's thesis of the the mm. Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism that. Uh, I mean, work, I mean, of course, I mean, work has been something which human beings have been doing since uh, the dawn of civilization. Um, but the present attitude to work is different in the sense that earlier work was something which you do along with your other uh, aspirations or your other pursuits in life. Whereas now work was the main uh, in the pursuit or, yes, yeah, or you, you were saying, yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. That, that's uh, exactly what Weber identifies as the specifically modern phenomenon, as something that really emerges at the end of the 16th, beginning of the 17th century, that you start to see a move away from a conception of work as um, a, an element of life that serves the human being, that is there to provide sufficient income to do the meaningful things in life, to, to sustain um, uh, an individual's real commitments, which are family, which are community, uh, which are, of course, religious life, cultural life. Um, uh, and there's a, a shift with the emergence of dissent in Christianity towards the conception of work as what Weber calls a behoof, a calling or the word we often use is vocation. And a vocation, of course, is uh, work which we don't simply do, but which defines us, um, which we identify ourselves with at uh, a spiritual and not just at a material level. Um, and I think that that is the big change that we have seen seeping into our culture to the point that it's so naturalized, it's so entrenched that we don't even see that there's any kind of, that it could be different. Um, you know, that there's a sort of famous or, or you know, very common observation that people who meet at parties or in some kind of social situation 
will always start by asking the other person, what is it you do? Um, and again, this sense that you find the entree into the other person through work um, has become a, a commonplace for all of us. And it, it, it creates a kind of impasse a lot of the time because um, actually most spheres of work don't really touch on each other that much necessarily. And if somebody tells you what they do, you may find that you have no entree into it at all. Um, whereas there are so many other kinds of questions that you could ask somebody that would allow you to tune in more to who they are, that would allow sort of your selves to meet somewhere. So there's something I think quite odd about the way that we have come to identify ourselves with our with our working selves yeah and uh, it becomes an issue because uh, if your failure at work becomes an existential failure or you, you have failed as a human being um or um and um there's, there's also uh, deep psychological reasons for our ambivalence with work, with the idea of work. Mm. Even though as a culture, we say that, uh, I mean, we, we, we treat work as the ultimate virtue and any lapse from it as, the un, as an unforgivable sin. Uh, yet in our actions, we are unable to live up to that virtue or that idealistic, uh, because- I think that's right. Yeah. You know, that there was, I, I don't know if you had a similar experience, but when I was at school, um, there was this very annoying um, sort of homiletical uh, phrase that teachers used to say to us when they were upset with us. And this was, you let the school down, or well, you've not just let your class down, you've let yourself down. Yeah. And I always thought this was the, the most you know, I, I, there was nothing that sort of, inter you know, quietly enraged me more than being told that I'd let myself down because I, I felt that it was up to me to decide when, <laughs> when I had let myself down. Um, but the, the thing is that now there's a truth to this idea of you've let yourself down because this is something that we tell ourselves. And one of the things that I talk about in the book is the distinction between a kind of a, a work superego and a work ego ideal. And these are terms that emerge in Freud. And the superego is actually the later term, but it's now the much more familiar term. I mean, in, in so far as psychoanalysis has sort of spread its language into a wider culture, um, you know, superego is one of the most commonly used phrases. And most people have some sense of what it means, that it, that it refers to this rather forbidding sensorious voice in you that tells you that you're not good enough, that you're not doing enough. It's a representative of, it's an internal representative of a higher authority, which could be God, it would, or it could be a teacher, or it could be a parent, or it could be a boss. But it's somebody who's telling you from above that you're not good enough. Um, and this was, I think, the model of work for much of the workforce um, until relatively recently. I think with the advent of consumer culture, in, in the you start to get the move towards a kind of ideology of self-maximization, of potentialization, of being the best person that you can. And this starts to make relevant, not so much the superego, who is an authority structure, an authority figure, as the ego ideal. Because the superego speaks to you from above. The ego ideal speaks to you from within, from the self. The ego ideal is really 
the best version of yourself. <clears throat> and Freud thinks of it as the residue of the way that you are reflected back to yourself in the eyes of your adoring parents who tell you that you are the most wonderful child, that you can do anything that you want to do, that you will become a prince or, um, uh, you know, that, that you be a woman, uh, if they're lucky enough to have you, that you will conquer the world and so on. You know, there is a certain kind of um, narcissism in the parents that, that is fed into the children and, and gives them this ideal version of themselves. And what this ideal version of ourselves is always telling us is, you can do this, you can be better, you can do more. Um, and it's, it's a kind of ideal mechanism for consumer culture which always wants to tell us that we can go a bit further and that we can do a bit more. Um, you can, of course, is the famous Nike slogan. Um, it's the way that a certain rhetoric of self-improvement works. You know, the personal trainer who says, come on, you can, you can do it. You're the best. You can do, you know, three more repetitions uh, on the bench press or whatever. Um, and rather than being a sort of forbidden figure above you like the superego who says you must now it's not pleasant to be subject to a superego but one of the things that it does is it, it affords a bit of distance the whole point about the superego is that it's distant from your ego it, it it tells you you know um i am here i am up here and you are down there and we are speaking to each other across this vertical gulf. Whereas the ego ideal is, is almost on a horizontal plane. It's just sort of saying to you, come on, come one step further. It's you speaking to yourself. And in many ways, that's much more insidiously persecutory because it's an authority structure that pretends to be your friend, that puts, puts its arm around you and says, come on, you can do better. And I think this is the voice that we often hear in ourselves, the voice that says, come on, don't let yourself down. You know, be the best that you can be. Um, and so we are always just a step behind where we feel we should be. And I think that's more what work, working life does to us. It makes us feel sort of more a little bit inadequate, a little bit falling short, than it does make us feel that we are sort of, you know, abjectly um, uh, failing in, in the kind of gross sense. You know, if you're not quite doing enough, and it'll be more agitating than just feeling that, you know, you're altogether not good enough. Yes, there's one interesting anecdote I read in Renata Salico's book, the On the Tyranny of Choice, mm -hmm. um, where, uh, I mean, and this is a scenario we can easily imagine happening, happening um, where typically the employee is laid off and uh, her reaction is uh, is not is not frustrated or anger at, at at the boss who's laying her off or you know, or, or feeling that something unfair is happening that you know she she deserves to be on the job but her reaction is please please tell me how may i better myself or how may i improve myself um, yes and i mean where this over interiorization i suppose of, uh, mm -hmm. of 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 a lot of factors which are social or political or uh, which are not entirely about your yourself which which have to do with your setting and it might not be that you need to change but that the world needs to change or your setting needs to be changed yeah yes that's right but the world is set up in such a way that you see its frustrations at the level of the of of, one, of your own individual efforts um, and of course 
that that is sort of one of the ideological achievements, if you like, of neoliberal society, that it does encourage us to see that whatever has gone wrong has gone wrong at the level of your personal choices, your individual efforts, your failure or success in measuring up to what's being asked of you. Um, and I think, yes, no, I, I, I know that uh, section in, in Renato Selakal's book. Um, oh, yeah. There's a, a, an, another incident that comes to mind, um, which is um, that bit more sinister. Um, I mean, I, I have sort of two, I suppose, uh, anecdotes that illustrate this nicely or, or yeah. Um, one is that there was, uh, you know, there was a famous current affairs series over here, Panorama. And a couple of years ago, um, they did uh, a documentary about call centers. And, um, so the the they um they filmed the call center and there was an exercise which was meant to be fun where the manager of the call center says to the call center workers we're going to start the morning singing we're all going to sing a pop song and so they sing a song by the killers called mr brightside and everybody has to sing along, right? But they're all singing along and singing along. And the manager is kind of jollying them along. You know, he's, he's sort of swinging his fists and saying, come on, everybody, sing, sing. And then he's interviewed after this exercise in employee motivation. And uh, he's asked, you know, what, what the point of it was. And he says, well, we ended up firing a couple of people because they weren't singing along. So this apparent exercise in togetherness and in workforce positivity actually becomes an exercise in surveillance and control um, and in division. And the failing, I think, in that context again is ascribed very much to the person who fails to participate enthusiastically enough if only you sung you know louder and more enthusiastically and entered into the spirit of the organization more generously um, you would have been able to keep your job I suppose the other sort of television <clears throat> illustration that came to mind of course is that you know um uh the leader of the free world uh so-called um uh, at the moment of course started life as a reality uh, started life i mean his previous life was as a reality tv star and at the end of the apprentice um every episode somebody of course gets fired and there's the famous you're fired and this was trump's line and this was over here it was alan sugar's line but what I always found interesting was the reply that always has to come from the, every week. The person who's fired has to say, thank you for this opportunity, Mr. Trump. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord. And um, <clears throat> uh, they were not allowed to express any sense of resentment or of any sense that it was something systemic or in the way that the whole task was set up that ended up with them being fired. They have to, in a way, internalize what they have to, not only internalize, but have to be shown to internalize the idea that this was their failing. Mm. And, um, you know, it, it, these, I think, are not, uh, not, features of our working culture they're not add-ons that add a, a particular sort of piquancy of, of of authority or discipline they are i think of the essence they are part of the structure of the way we work now yeah you know, that idea of that idea of interiorization that you were talking about yeah. yes um how about we 
we discuss some of these uh, uh, character prototypes that you mentioned uh, that you discuss in your book mm-hmm. uh for example the the burnout um and uh and i mean as i mentioned these these are tendencies which i feel uh present within myself at, at certain moments definitely yeah. and uh, but th- there's also one one more interesting thing which i noticed is that you don't use um uh any or, or you you deliberately i suppose avoid using any of the uh commonplace dsm categories to refer to any of these things because of course uh these are not just uh, medical conditions but these are i mean uh uh character traits within within uh, every human being to to some or the other extent yeah right i mean for example you yes. you don't talk about sure. uh, the bipolar tendency within us even though that we've been talking about right okay. yeah 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 sure sure yeah um yes i think that um i i didn't want to speak a language of pathology in the book as much as possible i was interested in using sort of commonly identifiable and identifiable character types i think because i think if you use the language of of medical or psychiatric pathology to describe a culture there's always going to be an element of imprecision there's always going to be something metaphorical about the way that 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 you use these these tendencies um and that often leads i think to controversy um burnout of course does have a certain kind i mean it's the, it's the one of the four categories that is sort of on the border the sort of common cultural term but it also has a certain kind of medical application as well um and certainly it's a sort of um a now very much recognized condition the world health organization recognizes it and uh it is um you know a sort of occupational health um hazard now recognized as such yeah because uh just to make make a reference here um th- this kind of an approach uh is taken by for example Darian Leader in his book on on the bipolar uh phenomenon right and because yes. he he makes this this connection between the condition and the and the overall culture in which we live yeah. which tends to facilitate yeah. these kind of conditions yeah. yeah yeah that's right um and i think i think he's right actually um i think that uh <sighs> what i think darren is trying to do in the book is to show how the spread of a sort of apparently discreet psychiatric phenomenon is related to tendencies in the wider culture um and on on that point i think he's absolutely right there is always i think a relationship between the way that certain diagnoses come into vogue in psychiatry and what is happening in the broader society and culture um <clears throat> so you know hysteria for example is a diagnosis that belongs very much to the age of the fin de siècle west to um uh an age in which um the roles of men and women are sort of undergoing radical questioning and change and uh so women finding find themselves asking what does it mean for me to be a woman and this sort of generates then uh all kinds of intense ambivalences particularly around sexuality that express themselves in the form of hysteria and yes i mean i think that um that our 24/7 culture um induces a a a kind of oscillation between frenetic activity and collapse which yes absolutely w- would would have an important relate to the increasing um uh prevalence of of the bipolar diagnosis uh, i think that, that that probably one could talk about um uh 
of sort of newly prominent diagnoses in this way. Um, you know, one could ask, at least have a discussion, what, what does the proliferation of autism diagnoses, um, uh, how does that relate to this? Um, the proliferation of personality disorder diagnoses. Um, uh, you know, broadline and narcissistic personality disorders, which, you know, were, were specialized terms a decade or two ago. Um, now, you know, they're, they're sort of commonly used insults on, on social media. Um, so I, I think the relationship between psychological and psychiatric diagnosis and, um, and, and the broader culture is incredibly important. I suppose I used um, cultural, more, more sort of almost folkloric or archetypal designations like burnout, lob, dreamer, daydreamer and slacker. I think I use those because um, I was partly interested in the different ways of resisting or um, at least putting in question a culture of over and stimulation. Um, and I think those four chapters that make up the bulk of the book are in a way different ways of inhabiting oneself and inhabiting one's culture in, in a kind of implicitly critical way that is in a way that that resists the um the, the sort of tacit tyranny of of enforced activity yes so um if we could focus on one um character type or this this prototype um, for example the burnout um, mm -hmm. and uh, how um, you uh, you actually mentioned at, at a certain point uh, you make this genealogical connection between the modern burnout and the historical or the uh, the traditional Christian word, uh, vice of acedia. Yes. Or which was mm. a, a spiritual crisis. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, acedia is, I think, a really fascinating piece of, of prehistory. Um, and I do feel that all of these character types um, have a very venerable prehistory. Um, and there is some reference to that, I think, in each of the chapters with um, the Asidiac. Um, yes, this was a feature of uh, religious community. Um, the monk who suffered Asidia um, was someone who had committed to the very ritual repetitive daily life of prayer and labor and you know maintenance of um of of the monastery of the monastic life and something about the isolation but also about the repetitiousness itself about the ways that the monk is locked into a horizon which never really changes um, starts to induce a kind of crisis of faith um, a feeling that uh, a feeling of isolation of no longer being fully connected or identified with the role in which they've with the role they've committed themselves to and so the monk starts to become uh, 
eerie and melancholic mm. and starts to complain of a kind of spiritual malaise <coughs> in which he's no longer able to inhabit his own prayers, <clears throat> no longer able to serve God and community with love. And this sense of a kind of uh, a plunge into melancholia is then accompanied by kind of worklessness, a feeling that there just isn't enough to motivate waking up in the morning, to motivate the, the kind of disciplined life of, <clears throat> of, of prayer and, and re repetitious work. And that spiritual connection can result in all kinds of, it can be a gateway into vice of various kinds, um, drinking, um, cynicism, all kinds of sin. So the point about acedia is, th is that it has a link to sloth, to one of the seven deadly sins. But it's the most profound of the deadly sins because it's the gateway sin. Once you let your guard down, once you drop the discipline of, um, of a kind of waking self, then anything can get into the mind and body, right? Lust can get into the body. Um, uh, greed and envy can, can stalk the soul. Um, you know, anger, all of the other vices, really, um, are conditioned by a kind of sloth, a letting down of the internal guard, uh, or a loss even of the internal guard. Um, and bringing that up to, to, the, to the burnout, which is the modern version of this acedia, when um, the American psychologist Herbert Freudenberger first coined this term for, um, burnout, um, his studies identified the phenomenon specifically in the caring professions, which in some ways, I think, are the modern day color current of the monk, um, in the sense that these are the demanding and repetitive professions, you know, whether it's, it's the carer, the nurse, the social worker, um, uh, even the general practitioner, even the psychiatrist, um, that this character of, of um, the caring professional brings to the workplace a certain, carries within him a certain um, idea, a certain pressure to comply with a kind of ideal version of what the carer is supposed to be. The carer is supposed to be generous, tolerant, forbearing, um, <clears throat> uh, dedicated, um, kind, and a kind of layering of difficulties. Um, so the find that they're mired in bureaucracy. Um, the carer may find that their connection to their patients or their clients um, is intruded upon by all kinds of institutional rules that make it very difficult to do the work itself. Um, so the work of care becomes degraded by uh, a kind of rule-bound bureaucracy um, and the, the conditions of both the institution and the broader culture make what, what is supposed to be spiritually uh, rewarding work and, and sort of emotionally rewarding work actually very grinding, very depressing. And this quickly then, you know, for example, the phenomenon of overwork in the caring professions, of course, is well documented. And um, uh, that leads to a kind of weariness and cynicism. And cynicism is one of the sort of key aspects of burnout that Freudenberger identified, that 
the sort of emotional and spiritual pleasure involved in ser serving others morphs into its opposite. It becomes something bitterly hateful. Um, and that expresses itself in a kind of cynicism or sarcasm, a kind of gallows humor um, about <clears throat> um, uh, the, the caring work itself. Um, so, so burnout ultimately manifests itself in a kind of indifference. Um, uh, one French writer um, wrote, I think, the, the really comprehensive book on this phenomenon, and it's called um, The Weariness of the Self. That the burnout is weary of the world, but also weary of him or herself, feeling really that they are stuck in a life and in a self which they take no pleasure in anymore. And so that's the point at which the motivation to continue sort of collapses. And with that collapse comes uh, not just an emotional, but also often a physical collapse. Um, an inability to move very much. And I, I talk about various phenomena um, in regard to this, the most famous one being the Japanese phenomenon of social withdrawal, hikikomori, um, <clears throat> where there is a whole generation of, of young Japanese men and women, um, perhaps more prevalent among the men, um, who withdraw into their bedrooms, who stop doing schoolwork, stop doing training, stop really participating in society altogether and simply sit on on their devices in their bedrooms um sort of shielded by by families who continue to feed them who continue to sort of care for them as much as is possible in this entirely withdrawn condition i mean at the heart of the hikikomori psychology uh you mentioned at the at the base of it is this this belief which has been um, uh, which has been ingrained in, in in people that they are infinitely perfectible or that that, yes. that they are actually uh, they i mean you, you can have whatever you want mm. uh, you can do whatever you want and um, but when i mean that, that, that's that's very very uh, grand uh, idea on the level of imagination but when it when when one trans tries to translate it into reality it uh, inevitably falls short and exactly. uh, reality is much more constricted than the imagination um, and so the wealth that the sort of the infinite pr proliferation of potential futures has in the end to give way to, to one actual future. Um, now, it's true that, you know, we all have a capacity for change and surprise, and we don't have to necessarily commit ourselves um, whole and irrevocably to one future at the expense of all others. But the, the, the problem is that if you understand this idea of infinite potential in a specifically consumerist register, when you go into a sort of consumer context, like a massive clothing store, you can choose an, or a massive supermarket. You can choose anything you like. I, I remember <clears throat> going when, when I was living in, in Boston at the end of uh, in 1999, a long time ago. But I, I remember sort of being suddenly aware of this because I wanted to buy some hummus. And we went in, we went to this massive um, Whole Foods supermarket, you know, very um, glitzy, beautiful. And there was a, a an entire floor to ceiling refrigerator, which seemed to be filled with with hummus, different brands of hummus. 
So there were about 12 different brands of hummus. And within those 12 brands, each one had five or six varieties. Um, and uh, actually, Renata Salakal in the book that you mentioned, mentioned something, uh, a sort of similar incident about cheese at the beginning of her book. For me, it was hummus, just standing in front of this refrigerator cabinet and, and experiencing this extraordinary um, paralysis of the mind, of the body. What was I supposed to reach for here? I would be going to do this. I tell an anecdote because the thing is, if you have an infinite proliferation of choices, it doesn't mean much unless you have within something that guides you to determine your own desire, to know what it is that you want. Otherwise, the infinite proliferation of choices becomes a tyranny, becomes persecuting. Um, it, it's because there's no particular Sorry? Um, infinite, infinite choice paralyzes action. paralyzes action. Yes, exactly. It paralyzes action because it, it, there's nothing internally that tells us why we should choose one brand, one path rather than another. Um, and I think one of the sort of phenomena of burnout um, that you can see resonating within the culture as a whole, that I think we are all in some way burnt out by a proliferation of choices that, that is accompanied on our side by a kind of absence of a kind of an internal navigator of, of, of all those choices. Um, and without a navigator, choice, as you say, is much more likely to paralyze than to actually motivate action. It's much more likely to lead to indecision than to enhance a meaningful decision. Yes. Well, uh, it seems to me that the ego ideal also, I mean, as you mentioned in your book, that uh, it, it leads to these, I mean, upon the onset of failure, you are you are led to shame and guilt. But mm -hmm. the ego ideal is also responsible for a sense of entitlement. Uh, yes. And... Uh, this perhaps is what is also being played out in the Hikikomori, uh, where you feel you deserve uh, everything. And uh, um, and I mean, when I mean, there's this this famous uh, um, saying that you know people say that um, don't settle for anything but the best. Yes. And this seems this seems to be to be taken literally in the case of Hikikomori. Um, where... Well, it's, it's it, yes, and it's yeah. really interesting what you say because, because the reproach will often come from a baby boomer generation, which will reproach sort of the two generations ahead or three generations ahead and saying, you're so entitled. We didn't have it so easy in my day. We weren't entitled. We had to work hard to get where we wanted to get to. And the point is, is it's that very generation which created the consumer culture that, that, that spread the ideology of perfectibility, that spread the ideology of nothing but the best. So the Hikimori generation was inculcated really from the first with the belief that they should expect the best from the world and from themselves. And when that becomes a problem, Instead of being able to say, well, there's then a broader problem at the level of culture and ideology, um, the, the Hikikomori experiences it as their own problem. And I think that that shame um, is enforced by the culture. Um, it, you know, in a sense, there's an agreement between the individual and culture that it is the individual's problem. Yeah, and there's also a very, uh, I mean, now it sounds a very similar case, which you mentioned in, in uh, another chapter on the, the daydreamer, 
uh mm-hmm. the, the you you name her grace uh she is yes. a musician uh mm-hmm. and after a, a very productive period in her life she comes into a period of 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 uh, of stagnation uh mm-hmm. she's un- unable to produce any more po- any more music uh and it, i mean it's it, it's i mean because because all these 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 categories uh i suppose are not watertight and they seep into one another and uh, yeah. um, uh, as you also mentioned and mm. it seems to me quite i mean there are some similarities between what's going on over here as well right yeah. and can you uh, say a bit more yeah i mean in the sense that uh uh perhaps she has this uh, this sense of entitlement uh, that you know she deserves this kind of a reality mm. Mm. because she, she also has the the dream of that reality in her mind but also sure. it's a, a, a sense of entitlement uh, and when that doesn't seem to be offered to her or or or, or doesn't seem uh, immediately available she doesn't try for it at all and she entirely circumvents uh, circumvented yeah yes i i think though that there's something more speci- more specific with her because <clears throat> there is maybe a sense of entitlement but i think also a sense of terror that one of the things that a culture of expect the best does is that it sort of asks you to assume that you want to reach the top that you want to um that you want sort of fame and praise and fortune and i think that when she came too close to getting the things she wanted it really frightened her um and i think that that's a kind of ally but but also discrete phenomenon that one of the reasons that it can be so difficult to get what we want is that we're quite frightened of what we want um that when our desires appear to be within reach it's a very sort of common trope of a, a you know a, a common turn in a life that we throw things away at the very moment that they're within our reach when we've been working for them um assiduously for for many years and i think that's something that happened to her that she in a way had had a very difficult quite traumatic um childhood and wasn't sure about her sense of entitlement wasn't sure what she could expect from life and i think she wasn't ready to sort of be in receipt she wanted and 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 instead sort of ran in the other direction retreated sort of went into a kind of um cubby hole Um, yeah. of, of of inactivity <clears throat> and, uh, and withdrawal yes and but it, it, in both the cases it seems to me that uh, the therapeutic goal might be a common one but i mean again it's 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 problematic to speak of a therapeutic goal in the context of psychoanalysis sure uh, but, i mean I, i'm not saying in that sense of a fixed or a presupposed goal in that sense but uh, broadly i suppose what ends up becoming a therapy for both of these these scenarios is that uh, trying to find a middle path or a yes. middle ground i mean between between either of the extremes yes i mean obviously that case is disguised and i i tried at the end in a way to um w- with i mean part of the disguise in a way was was the idea that she was a composer um which it, the, the real case was not a composer but um she uh goes uh, and i say that you know like icarus she flies too close to the sun in the first instance and when you fly too close to the sun to the sort of the glory of the heights the problem is like icarus your wings melt and you end up mired in the sea 
So um, the, the name of the composition that she writes at the end and she gives to me at the end of the analysis is between sea and sky um, because it, it sort of, it's, it's the place that mediates between the depths of the sea that you fall into and heights of the sky where you soar above everybody else. Um, somewhere between is a space where one can sort of sustain ambitions and desires um, without completely taking leave of, of the ground below, without soaring too high. <clears throat> I think that, that was, that was um, and you know, the, the, the real case I could probably say was um, also a creative person who created something that was analogous or correlative to, to the composition that I described. Yeah. Yes, um, and we're almost out of time. We can do one more one more question if you want, or yeah, I'll miss I'll miss the kickoff. It's okay. Yeah. No, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I mean, uh, there's just, um, I mean, this is the book over here, and uh, I've uh, read it twice at this point, and uh, really found it very engaging, and uh, I'm I'm really uh, excited to pursue some of these references. Um, and um, yeah, uh, it's, it seems, um, if, if we can talk about, uh, yeah, I mean, at the end, I suppose, um, about doing nothing. I mean, we can end with this. Um, mm. Uh, Oscar Wilde's quote that doing nothing is the most difficult thing to do in the world mm. um, and uh, when you're calling for not working of course you, you don't mean it in a negative sense yeah. in the sense of not doing something but of doing something something which is not uh, just uh, an action or a, or a mindless action yes yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's absolutely right and that quote of course is from Oscar Wilde and what Oscar Wilde was referring to when he talked about doing nothing is the most difficult thing in the world he did what he always does really which is to invert common wisdom the idea that action is the difficult thing the idea that action is what requires wakefulness and and attentiveness and Wilde is saying no actually action is is blind um, he says, um, action is the preserve of people who have nothing better to do, which is a sort of typical wild provocation. Um, uh, but what he means is that um, action tends, once it becomes a mode of life, once it becomes identified with who you are, it tends to get cut off from the life of thought. Um, and Schopenhauer also talks about this in relation to the fixity of habit, the way that habit has a, a, a way of taking over our minds and bodies and eliminating contemplation or reflection. <clears throat> so what not working does, what inactivity does, is that it clears the field of obligation to act and makes us ask the question what is it that i want to do now where is it that i want to go now that is why in a way the slacker is the figure that ends the book because the slacker is always trying to keep this question in mind he lives a life which is pragmatic and provisional that is moving from one place to another and that is is animated always by the question what is it that I want to do? Where is it that I want to go? And I suppose the inspiration for this book was the observation that most of us at a certain point start to forget these questions and sink into a kind of habitual blind activity. 
Um, and our culture encourages that. So this is about putting that in question. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Josh. For, uh, it's, it's been a wonderful conversation. and Thank you for your time. Thank you. Yeah. My pleasure, sir. And uh, it's lovely to talk to you. Yeah. And I, I look forward to reading your new next book on how to live. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, I hope well, I, I hope you enjoy it, and um, uh, please do be in touch um, about definitely. psychoanalysis if you want to be. Oh yes, definitely. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye.